So back in January, I started restoring this Coleco Telstar Alpha, and now it's Marchintosh, and I'm still back in 1977 with this Alpha. After a good cleaning and with some fiddling, we got it to work through the RF modulator, which was absolutely shocking. But in order to drag it kicking and screaming into the 21st century, we at least wanted to get a composite output out of it, which should have been as easy as just bodging in an RCA jack into the right points on the board, but never quite worked right. So now, with the help of a brand new drop-in replacement mainboard for those vintage Pong chips, we'll be playing online. Alright, since it was watching Dave Plummer's video on rebuilding his Coleco Telstar from scratch, just reusing the logic chips, that led me to decide that I could rebuild the guts of the Alpha the same way. Uh, I'm going to let Dave do a little bit of the heavy lifting here in KiCad. Uh, on his GitHub, he has the design already laid out for the way his Telstar is set up. Uh, I am going to have to make some modifications for the way my Telstar is set up because the Alpha has a couple of different options. But as a general rule, we can pretty much copy paste what he's got to start with. One of the biggest differences between these boards is actually going to be the fact that Dave's board, he was able to offload everything to a pin header for all of his controls and switches and everything. Uh, for the Telstar Alpha, it's cost reduced. It's squished down into a box. Uh, that all needs to be on the main board. So I will need to find all the components for that and figure out how they're connected and then also find proper footprints for all of them, which was not the easiest task I've ever come across. This meant finding the pinouts and footprints for 45 year old slide switches. Uh, multi-selector slide switches at that, which I don't have part numbers for, as well as the uh, one mega ohm potentiometers, which the closest thing I could find in the KiCad library was actually guitar potentiometer. So jumping ahead here a little bit, I've got the switches laid out on here, and I'm using the global flags to be able to move the data around without having to draw lines everywhere. Also, I decided to keep the sound amplification circuit intact because I don't know why Dave took it out of his, but my Telstar is not very loud. I assume I do need to keep the sound amplification circuit. Uh, additionally, I noticed Dave left these diodes out of his, and although I could see why they seemingly don't do anything, I'm going to leave them in because they are in fact on the AY38500 datasheet. With the schematic complete, we can move on to actually mapping out the PCB. Now, because I'm replacing an existing PCB in an existing footprint, everything has to line up so it fits through the case. I have to get these measurements very precise and get them very right. Any one piece is off by just enough that I can't close the case, and I gotta go back to the beginning and build a whole new circuit board. Let's start it out with measuring the outside diameter of the board, and then finding all of the holes for the supports and measuring out from which edge and how big the holes were and making sure I correlated all that correctly into ECAD before we started placing any components. This also included finding exactly where the different switches needed to line up, where the pins were. There were a lot of things that had to line up exactly right. Luckily, there was also a lot of things that I had a lot of leeway with. For example, resistors, capacitors, and logic chips can go pretty much anywhere on the board as long as they're not covering up a hole I need for support. Uh, but things like this vintage pot have to go exactly where they're going to pop through the top of the case. New footprint. This new footprint has to be a through hole. The uh, vintage pot. Okay. I'm not going to go through the process of designing a new footprint from scratch for an item. Uh, there are way better videos than mine out there for that. But all it really was was a lot of taking measurements and double checking and even a fair amount of guessing, especially on the pad sizes. With everything laid out on the board and a quick print to make sure that all of the solder points seem to line up with where I think their holes should be on the new version. It's time to send it off to be made. 16 paranoia filled days later. My boards have finally arrived. 
Thank you to the folks at JLC PCB, though not a sponsor. Uh, very happy with the work they do consistently. Everything looks good at first glance. The turnaround time was actually quite quick, but I'm impatient, so I'm going to jump right into this. This is intended to be a drop-in replacement. Assuming I measured everything right, and it felt like I did, we'll be able to move the pots from here to here. Uh, move our switch, although I'm going to order a new one, uh, just because I don't like the play on that for our reset. Our game select switch, skill switch, power switch, should all drop right down. AY38500-1. Move from there to there. Left a hole in the back for the speaker, same as it was. I tried to recreate as much as I could, with a couple of exceptions. There is no more RF modulator on the new board. That space has been converted over for the possibility of adding HDMI. Since finding this connector was not worth my time, that's the best way I can describe it. Uh, I'm sure I could have found one, I'm sure I could have found an original and paid way too much for it, but since I'm building a new board anyway, I'm going to go with connectors I have on hand that go with readily available uh, adapters so I don't have to worry about it. I am going to leave connections for the batteries and I'm going to re-put the spade connectors back in, but I'll probably never put batteries in it, but it will have the option. And now a quick little montage to wrap two afternoons worth of soldering into about 40 seconds so that we can test the board with all the passives installed. The 7805 is not entirely necessary as it's only used to power the HDMI converter, but I'm going to install it and make sure that that works fine as well. And with everything soldered in, all that's left is to give it some juice and throw the switch. No smoke. Yeah, you know how I just said there was no smoke? Well... I was wrong. I needed to leave it on for about a minute and then R2 here just lit up. Um, apparently that is just a resistor from 9 volts to ground and I don't think it's supposed to be like that. Let me... Okay. So after uh, about two days of looking at this and a couple of adult beverages Scratching my head. This is what I found. Right here. This junction should not be a junction. And the only thing I can think of is I changed the footprint for the RCA jack. The 044, because that's what I have in stock instead of the 051. I ended up redrawing this line. And for some reason, it made a connection here, which shouldn't have been here. And I probably shouldn't have drawn the line that way anyway, which then just took this resistor, 9 volts, which is our VCC in the system, to ground, and then grounded out both sides of this transistor, so it was never going to do anything, and I would never get any output. None of it would ever work. And the new configuration... I'm just running ground over the top. I mean, yeah, that, that was it. Well, that was the whole thing. I'm glad I never put any logic chips in the board after I after I saw the smoke. I don't have a choice. I'm going to send off new board for new boards uh, after I make these tweaks on the PCB. The following Thursday. And since you've already watched me put this board together once through the magic of editing, here is a complete board with our 9-volt power source plugged in. Just going to check, make sure... We have power at the 
jack and not anywhere else. None of the pins anywhere else should have power since the switch is off. There's a tiny little bit of leak through the switch, but it's even less than the reverse through the diode for the battery, so I'm not going to worry about it. With that all checked out, we'll turn the switch on, check everything again. We'll pop in our 4011 and check for our clean 2 MHz clock signal. I'll call it clean enough. And still having seen no smoke, we'll put the rest of the logic chips in. No smoke. That's a good start. Let's put the speaker. What you're seeing here is what happens when the AY3-8500 does not get a low signal on any of its game input pins. It doesn't know what to do so it tries to play all of them simultaneously. I figured out that the problem is actually physically within the game select switch. Okay, for the moment, I'm gonna put this project on hold. I'm gonna put the case back together, make sure I can get my power cord in and my composite video out and call it good. Finding a replacement for these switches, especially this one, which I have no part number for, and was produced sometime in 1977 or 1978 has been extremely difficult. I found a couple of things that I think might be close. The um, tech diagrams, the schematics look like they might function. The holes in the board are actually quite large, so it might actually still work. I'm a little worried that the actual um, switches might be too short, but I'm, I'll get them in. I've also think I've finally found some potentiometers that might be able to replace these. So if these are damaged for somebody, they'd be able to use those. And the HDMI board, I'm going to look for a better uh, composite to HDMI converter. Uh, this one works fine for many things. I've used it with my Atari 2600 and a lot of other stuff. Anything that doesn't break the NTSC signal once it's started and doesn't jump immediately into the game, it's great for. This particular setup, you will miss the first point or two because of the delay. This needs to reacquire the signal and start outputting the HDMI. And every time you hit the reset switch, it stops the whole chip, which also stops the NTSC signal, which causes this to go, hey, I've got no signal, and then kick, try and kick back in. So, our Telstar Alpha. Mostly restored, waiting on a few parts, but the new logic board, completely sound. The paddles work wonderfully. They're not scratchy. They, they all hit the right points. Um, the switches, a little stiff, but you know, they're 30 plus years old. 40 plus years old. The switches are a little sticky, but it's not much I can do there. They're, they're 40 plus years old. But the logic board is sound. The replacement board is great. Um, running off the crystal oscillator seems to be working perfectly now. All in all, I am quite happy with how this has turned out. And once I have the new switch for this one, it'll be perfect. I really appreciate you taking your time to watch my videos. And if you like what I'm doing here, please give me a thumbs up, leave a comment, subscribe. Share it with anyone else you think might enjoy some of this retro gaming history. And moving forward, I've definitely learned a lesson from this project. I think I'm going to completely finish a project and then post up all the videos a little bit apart 
and then let it out over a couple of weeks while I work on the next project. Uh, I think that's just going to give us all some better content and it'll be much more enjoyable for everybody. So I'll see you later and thank you.